today. I hope you know who I am. If you don't, I'm Chad Cooper. I'm the executive director of Sustainable Sanctuary Coalition. We are one of the hosts tonight. We also are hosted by uh, Village Church here, their Environmental Action Committee. Jerry Reese there in the back, he is the representative here. And we're also um, hosted by uh, Earth Keeper. Um, and they are... Uh, Look, there's a, what about that one? Oh, that'd be perfect. Uh, church here in Kansas City area. So anyway, so thanks for uh, being here. Um, we are doing Zoom hybrid. We're in person and we're also recording. And so if you're in Zoom uh, land, thank you for being here. If you'll mute your microphone at the moment, so that John doesn't hear you uh, talking there in the background uh, while he presents, that would be great. Um, and so uh, I'll let John introduce himself, but John's uh, been around for a long time working for the environmental uh, actions here in Kansas City. He's uh, worked for Bridging the Gap uh, for how many years, John? Over um, 10, 20, 11. 30? Uh, 11. 11 years with Bridging the Gap. He helps run the recycling program, the different uh, sites around Kansas City, which I'm, I would bet many of you have uh, benefited from. He also works with 350KC. Um, he and I have worked on several uh, projects together. We worked on a, a Kansas City-wide uh, uh, rally in 20, pre-COVID, yeah, where we had a thousand people come out to the plaza. We did a rally. We had various speakers, and it was a, a really great event. And he continues on. Um, COVID was interesting for a lot of folks um, in the environmental committee and community <laughs> of trying to do their work. Uh, but John is still here. He is... Um, always here caring for the environment and uh, being a voice uh, of reason and uh, pushing the edges of what we consider to be uh, helpful. And so John, tell a little bit about yourself. I don't want to take any more time. I will turn it over to you. Let's give a round of applause to John Kermit. Thank you everyone for showing up tonight here in person and everyone out there streaming in as well. Uh, if my voice tends to get it to a lower volume as we're talking, just tell me to raise it up because I do have a tendency to do that. As Chad mentioned, I do currently work for Bridging the Gap, but I should give you a disclaimer. I am not here on behalf of Bridging the Gap tonight. I do not ascribe any of my opinions that I expressed tonight to Bridging the Gap. I'm not saying people there wouldn't agree with me, but I'm not speaking for Bridging the Gap. Uh, I've been doing activism of one kind or another for steadily for a good 29 years now. I know, I know you're thinking, oh, he's too young for that, but uh, uh, good 29 years now. I've worked on various issues over the years, population growth, consumption growth, local and organic agriculture. I've been part of the Kansas City Food Circle. I've uh, always been working for social change because at the deepest level, Social change is what we need to get the big change, to get the changes we need with all our behaviors, all our systems, all our regulatory, all our economics. Uh, mostly these days I work on climate in my activist life, but I do focus on recycling in my work with Bridging the Gap. Um, so tonight we're going to talk about the right recycling reset, why it's failing and what to do. The first thing I want to tell you is, is if you're here tonight because you wanted to hear about recycling, you've probably been overemphasizing recycling. You've probably been worrying too much about can I recycle this and can I recycle that and what happens to it and all of these things. Um, there's a number of reasons for that, but I want to give you a quote here because this quote really struck me when I heard it in an NPR news story back in April of 2021. The title of the story was, Is Recycling Worth It Anymore? Recycling, when it works, is a valuable way to preserve resources, but we overbelieve in it. That word, that expression, we overbelieve in it, really struck me because I thought it was a particularly telling way of expressing how we have dealt with the problem of waste in this country, which recycling was intended to address. Um, but literally recycling is the least we can do 
about our waste production in the, this country. It's the least. It's the first step up from just burying it in a hole in the ground. Well, I suppose you could say there's a lower step of just go throw it in a field, but no one in here and no one out there would do that, would you? Um, so Americans have overbelieved in recycling. And I'd say there's two reasons for that, really. One, recycling is very visceral because who among us does not every single day, at some point, at least once, find yourself with something in your hand that you don't want in your home anymore, and you have to decide what to do with it. It is literally, recycling is the part we literally hold in our hands, we literally touch. So it's very visceral, it's very salient as our participation in the waste system. What do we do with this? Do we put it in the recycling bin? Do we put it in the trash? What do we do? So it's visceral, but I also think at a deeper level, at a subconscious level, that Americans have put virtually all, Americans broadly speaking, have put virtually all our attention with regard to reducing waste on recycling. Because it asks the least of us. It requires the least change. At the most basic level, all it requires us to do is to throw it in the recycling bin instead of the trash bin. And then we're done. <laughs> Compared to the other things we need to do to reduce waste, that's simple. And honestly, you know, I work at a drop off recycling center and I sometimes get the feeling from people who come in with something, they're determined to recycle it, particularly something like this stuff, <laughs> that they're determined to recycle, that they're seeking, and I can use this term because I was raised Catholic, they're seeking a kind of absolution for their consumption. If I can just recycle this, I am free. I have done my duty. My soul is clear. But folks, there's a reason that recycling is the last of the three traditional R's. What are they? Reduce, reuse, recycle. Why is it the last? Because it has the least benefits. Why is that? The reason for that is that the impact of producing both the coffee that was in this cup and the cup and lid, most of the impact of doing that happened upstream before that ever touched your hand. Yeah, it matters how it's disposed of, but most of the impacts were upstream. If you're not dealing with the upstream impacts and you're focusing just on that, you're missing most of the impact. And let me tell you, corporations are happy for us to focus on recycling. <laughs> They, in fact, have spent decades, particularly the plastics industry, telling us, focus on recycling. And because I also work in climate action, telling us to focus on our personal carbon footprints. Don't think about what they're doing. Don't regulate them. Worry about your own personal carbon footprint, your own personal ecological footprint, more broadly speaking. You know, we live in a consumer society and we have since before I was born, although it's certainly been exacerbated over the nearly 58 years I've been alive. And that consumer society is not an accident. It is a deliberate creation. It is not merely an outgrowth of human nature, although it exploits tendencies in human nature. It was created 
deliberately. This is a screenshot from the website for Orion Magazine. This article was published in 2008 in Orion Magazine. It's still online. If you got one of the flyers, there's a link to it on the back. It's long, but it's so important. The Gospel of Consumption, a highly appropriate title for our setting tonight, The Gospel of Consumption by Jeffrey Kaplan. And he lays out the history of how back in the 1920s, the industrial titans of America realized with industrialization and fossil fuels that they had the capacity to produce far more stuff than Americans were interested in buying. And they wanted to make more money. So how do you exploit your industrial capacity if people aren't buying enough stuff? You convince them that they need to buy more stuff. That process began in the 20s. Then there were a couple little hiccups with the plan. One, the Great Depression, and then World War II. But as soon as we came out of the war and things were settling down, they got right back to convincing us to buy more stuff going to read you. It's a long quote, but it's so powerful, I think it's important. This is a quote from uh, an article written by Victor Lebeau, or Lebeau, I'm not sure how he said his name. He's a marketing consultant. It appeared in the Journal of Retailing, spring 1995. Our enormously productive economy demands that we make consumption our way of life, that we convert the buying and use of goods into rituals, that we seek our spiritual satisfactions, our ego satisfactions in consumption. The measure of social status, of social acceptance, of prestige is now to be found in our consumptive patterns. The very meaning and significance of our lives today expressed in consumptive terms. The greater the pressures upon the individual to conform to safe and accepted social standards, the more does he tend to express his aspirations and his individuality in terms of what he wears, drives, eats, his home, his car, his pattern of food serving, his hobbies, these commodities and services must be offered to the consumer with a special urgency. We require not only forced draft consumption, but expensive consumption as well. We need things consumed, burned up, worn out, replaced and discarded at an ever increasing pace. We need to have people eat, drink, dress, ride, live with ever more complicated and therefore constantly more expensive consumption. It was a plan. Victor Labau, I imagine he's long dead, but Victor Labau would be uh, probably awed by how successful the plan proved to be. Now, if you came out to Sustainable Sanctuary Coalition this evening, You probably are not at all surprised for me to tell you that we're wrecking the world with our consumer way of life. This is an image from the uh, Global Footprint Network. Every couple of years, they put out a report which calculates how much we are exceeding the Earth's capacity to sustain our population, essentially drawing down the inheritance we were given. So globally, at average consumption levels, we would need 1.75 Earths to sustain current consumption levels for the current population, both of which are growing. That's bad enough because we don't have an extra Earth. But if you look at the very top there, there actually are a few nations where the average footprint it is higher, but they are nearly as big as the United States, which is still the third largest nation in the world. 5.1 Earths to sustain the average U.S. consumption level for the entire world's population. Now, even if you think that's a great overstatement, a vast, uh, let's say it's double reality, that still means 2.5 Earths 
Anybody know where to find some extra arts? I don't, but the plan is to expand our consumer way of life to everyone, to all those in the so-called and condescendingly referred to developing world. Well, what does it mean to say they're developing? That means they're behind us. and They really need to catch up and be like us, right? Because we're developed. That's the plan is to expand this to the whole world. Now, not only are we wrecking the world, not only can that literally not happen, perpetual growth on a finite planet is by definition impossible. Not going to happen. But we're also wrecking ourselves. Whoop. Shouldn't have gone to that one yet. We're also wrecking ourselves. We're not just wrecking the world. We are part of the world. We're wrecking ourselves as human beings because this economy that is set out to convince us that we always need more stuff is what I call the perpetual dissatisfaction machine. Advertising sells a lot of goods, so-called goods. Isn't it interesting they use that word? A lot of products a lot of services, and you know, you're know you not convinced by every ad you see to buy this or that thing that they're selling. But the one thing that virtually all advertising is selling us is this. You're not good enough the way you are. Your hair's frizzy. You're going gray. You're losing your hair. Your clothes are out of style. Aren't you embarrassed to be wearing that old fashioned? Look at you. Oh, you smell bad. You really drive a 10 year old car? <laughs> and what they're selling us under that is status, is the admiration and the desire of other people. Because we're status-seeking primates, if I may say so. We're always thinking about where we stand in the social order. Some of us, obviously, much more than others, Kardashians. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but we're all, to one degree or another, thinking about, do people like me? Do they think I'm interesting? Do they want to spend time with me? Well, they're exploiting that perfectly human, perfectly normal feeling. Now, often when you start talking about, well, we can't go on consuming the way we are. Yes. We're devouring the world. We're wrecking our lives. We just can't keep doing this. People often think, well, why do you want me to give things up? All this wonderful stuff that's making us so happy. If it's making us so happy, why is there so much depression? Why is there so much anxiety? Why do we have to worry when our kids go off to school if they're coming home? Or the mall, or a church, or wherever, a parade. That's because it ain't making us happy. It's eating us up, just as we're eating up the rest of the world. Fixing this is not only about putting an end to our war on the rest of the world, but getting the things that really make people happy. Belonging, security, purpose, being part of something greater than ourselves. That's what really makes people happy. Not a new car. It'll give you a thrill if you're into that, but it doesn't make you happy over the long term. So that's the sermon part tonight. But I'm going to talk about more concrete things with regard to recycling as well. If you've been paying attention over the last five years, you've probably read or seen or heard or all three some pretty dire stories about the state of recycling, that recycling is in crisis. And that's true. Recycling has been in crisis over the last years. Now, the trigger for that crisis is mostly ascribed to be China, the biggest economy and the biggest population in the world, imposing limits on what they would accept as far as recycling imports, strict contamination limits. That was called 
translated to English, the National Sword Policy. That went into effect January 1st of 2018. Now, National Sword essentially said contamination limits for recycle, the, the main focus was on mixed plastics and mixed paper materials. Contamination levels had to be so low, if I remember right, it's 0.5% in a bale, that essentially it was impossible for materials recovery facilities in the United States to meet that standard. So while it wasn't technically a ban, in practice, it was virtually a ban on imports. Well, that was a big shock to the system because America, the United States, and other industrialized countries had been shipping a lot of they're really low quality recyclable materials, heavily contaminated over China to China with the hopes that they would actually be recycled. Now, why was it viable to do that? Well, think about it. You go into a store, how much stuff was made in China? Well, that stuff was shipped to the United States on container ships and containers, and those containers went back. Well, I send them back empty if we can fill them with stuff that we don't want to recycle here, but we sure would like to recycle, but it to be recycled. So we were basically dumping a lot of contaminated, low value, dirty stuff, and they finally got tired of dealing with it. And I have news for you. It didn't all get recycled. Believe me. Uh, a big trigger for them making the decision to impose these contamination limits was a documentary called Plastic China. I think it came out in 2015 or 2016. I forget which. Um, but it basically revealed that a lot of this stuff was getting open dumped, dumped into waterways, where, of course, it ends up in the ocean. Ultimately, a lot of it open burned. And so China does not like bad PR. <laughs> And so they said that they also no longer had as much need for materials coming in to be recycled from other countries because as their economy has grown and they have become more of a consumer society, they're producing more of their own waste domestically. So it is definitely time for a recycling reset. Now to really reset recycling, the fact of the matter is, is there's no getting around the fact that we need to elect governments that will actually regulate and impose policies to fix the system. I mean, why is it that we don't require companies to design for minimizing waste, design for recyclability, design for repairability, to make it clear on the packaging whether things are truly recyclable or not, instead of putting very misleading things on the package, sometimes intentionally, sometimes because they just don't know any better. But why don't we do that? And why? So there's beginning to be a move in some states because we can't get any action from the federal government on this yet. And there's certainly been action in the European Union on laws that are called, broadly speaking, extended producer responsibility laws. So they put the onus for disposal of things on the companies that profited from making the things. Seems obvious. What companies have done and what they would be happy to continue to do is to leave the onus on us as citizens and on the governments, that the local governments that are dealing with us calling in and saying, we want to recycle. Where's the recycling program? Well, we clamored for recycling. We got recycling, but it's definitely struggling. Now, I'm not here tonight to go into detail about extended producer responsibility laws and all that sort of thing. The, the reality is with a divided Congress and both the Kansas legislature and the Missouri General Assembly, we're not getting the laws we need anytime soon. So. I just want to put that in your brain, though, because, again, this goes back to the corporations wanting us to think about it's our individual responsibility to figure this stuff out. No. In a society that's a representative democracy, we have an instrument called the government, the instrument of our collective will, and we don't have to let them keep getting away with this. That means electing different governments, but it could be done. Now, after all this talk about don't overemphasize recycling and 
don't lose sight of the bigger picture that what you recycle at home is not the end all and be all of what needs to be done. In fact, it's really a small fraction of it. It still does matter. Um, uh, if you, some of you are familiar with Project Drawdown, recycling is on the list of the climate solutions from Project Drawdown. I think it, it does rank fairly low. I'm not remembering the exact ranking in the potential impact. 60. 60. Rank 60th. Is that just household recycling or is that recycling more broad? Household recycling ranks 60th out of what 80, I think, currently uh, solutions for project drawdown. But it does still matter what we do with our waste because, and you know, some of the original impetus for recycling was concern about landfills filling up. And that's a valid concern to some extent. You may have been paying attention to the news here in Kansas City lately. There's so a company wanting to put a new landfill out in South KCMO, a lot of people are upset about that who happen to live where they want to put that landfill. Well, I don't blame them. Who wants to live near a landfill? But the reality is we keep producing so much waste. We are eventually, it's not going to happen imminently, but we are going to run out of space in the current Johnson County landfill and Sugar Creek landfill at some point. So we will need another landfill if we don't change. But more important than the burying stuff in the ground is we need recycling. So we don't have to keep cutting down forests the way we are. We don't have to keep mining so many minerals with all of the impacts that that entails. We don't have to keep extracting so much oil and natural gas to make plastics. I mean, recycling does matter. Just don't put it above where it belongs because, you know, the reality is, as I said earlier, virtually all of us, virtually every day, will at least have one thing we need to dispose of. So it does matter to recycle, but you gotta recycle correctly, folks. Rule number one, no wish cycling. Some of you have probably heard the term wish cycling, but if you haven't, what that refers to is that moment when you have the thing in your hand, and you're standing there and you got your recycling bin and you got your trash bin and you're like, I don't know, but I sure would like for it to be recycled. <laughs> so you toss it in the recycling bin. Don't ever do that. Never, ever, 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 ever. Check your recycling provider's guidelines. If they don't say, Yes, we take it. Don't put it in the recycling bin. It is much better to put something that could have been recycling in the trash than to put something that can't be recycled in the recycling because you undermine recycling. Recycling is a blunt instrument, folks, the way it works because the economics of it are marginal at best. There is no way we can pay armies of people to sort through all of the, the wish cycling that Americans have tossed into a bin and separate the good from the bad. It would never be economically viable that way. It is a blunt instrument. So no wish cycling, check your provider guidelines. Now that's getting, has gotten more complicated lately. Hopefully many of you, maybe all of you have a copy of the recyclespot.org, recycle more, recycle better flyer which was created to be a curbside recycling guide for the entire metro area. Unfortunately, it is outdated. It's in the process of being updated to reflect the new realities of recycling post-national sword. In particular, what it says about plastics is going to change very, very significantly. All the details are not ironed out yet. So the flyer you have, and maybe we can get this sent out to people who are, on, who are on Zoom somewhere or another. The flyer you have that I've handed out here provides some definite things that are going to have to change and some things that are still up in the air that I don't have answers to yet. Hopefully we can send out once the final version is created by the Mid-America Regional Council Solid Waste Management Division, um, we can get that all, that new updated curbside recycling flyer out to everybody. But I have provided you some tips on the sheet you have there. Big changes are coming. Next rule, cleanliness counts. 
Some people think, based on what I see at the recycling center, that literally all they have to do to recycle is to not throw it in the trash bin, throw it in the recycling bin. Not clean it, not rinse it, not even sometimes empty it. That doesn't work. Cleanliness counts. Now you may be wondering, why does cleanliness count so much? Doesn't matter so much on the plastics if plastics were recycled by themselves, because they can be washed, they will be washed. On metals, if they were recycled by themselves, when they melt that metal to recycle it, anything on it's going to burn off. But of course, if you're curbside recycling or are you in a living apartment complex or a condo or whatever, you're putting your recyclings in with paper products. I don't know about you, but I've spilled something on an important piece of paper before, and I discovered that you can't wash paper. Anything that's on it is going to be in the recycled material. So all the other materials must be clean so the paper stays clean. We could get around that by having what's called a dual stream recycling. And there's been some talk about this where one week they collect your plastics and your cans, the other week they collect your paper. That actually would be better in a lot of ways, but I don't know if it'll ever happen in Kansas City. But in the meantime, even at the recycling centers where we take things in separate bins, when they get processed, they get processed in what's called a materials recovery facility. And there they come into contact with paper products. So if they're dirty, they're going to dirty the paper products. And there's some tolerance for that. Paper products don't have to be absolutely clean, but literally if paper products get above a certain level of dirtiness, even if they were collected for recycling, they're just going to go to the landfill. That's just the reality of the system. So let's talk about that process, the materials recovery facility process for a while. So we have two materials recovery facilities in the metro area. Waste management operates one out in KCK near 435 and the river. And uh, GFL, new to our area, bought out WCA, operates one out in Harrisonville. Up on the back of the flyer I gave you, there's a link to a waste management video on YouTube, which it's not a long video, but it shows you the basics of how it works at the waste management facility. And it basically works the same at GFL, same kind of equipment. It shows you how things are actually processed there. Some people, some sometimes people come to the recycling center and say, is this stuff really getting recycling? I'm like, in my head, I'm like, I think I'm faking this? I ain't doing it for the money, believe me. <laughs> Um, it would be an awfully big and expensive and protracted fraud if we were faking recycling. Now, does that mean everything that goes into the materials recovery facility gets recycled? Of course not, because again, people are putting stuff in there that isn't recyclable, and they're putting stuff in there that's too dirty, and so on and so on. But we're doing our best to actually recycle it. So when stuff shows up at the materials recovery facility, all that stuff mixed together, the paper, the cans, the plastics, etc., Obviously, it can't all be recycled like that. So what happens in a materials recovery facility is not recycling. It's processing, separation of the materials, getting them into a form that they can, can be sold to other companies to actually recycle them. They begin that process by running the stuff down a conveyor belt. Most of the process is automated because, again, if you had to pay people to do all the work, it would never be economically viable. So they run it down a conveyor belt, and it begins with workers standing on each side, and they pluck out anything that's going to tangle in the machinery, like plastic film. If you were putting any plastic film, plastic shopping bags, bread wrappers, air pillows, those things that come in the online shipping, bubble wraps, any plastic film, anything that will wrap around your arm, you are causing a problem at the materials recovery facility because that stuff tangles up in the machinery. They have to sh typically shut down the line. A few to several times a day, workers have to climb inside, and you can see this in the video that I have the link to on the sheet, and cut that stuff out or it's going to jam up the machinery. They pluck out things that are going to, rigid things that are going to jam the machinery. They pluck out things that are going to pose a hazard to workers, like propane tanks and, and stuff like that. People put crazy things. People regularly, bowling balls show up in materials <laughs> recovery facilities. All kinds of crazy things go into recycling bins. Uh, they pluck out the larger things that aren't accepted for recycling. The next step in the process is a screening to screen out small contamination, stuff that got into the recycling either intentionally or by accident that isn't actually recyclable, like food, dirt. You know, we have in Kansas City, Missouri, we're changing, but currently most people still have open top totes. So 
you set that out on a windy day and all kinds of things can end up in the recycling. Um, but we are changing the carts. Uh, broken glass. The side effect of that is anything small, and by small, I mean anything smaller than a tennis ball, even if it's technically a material that's accepted for recycling, gets screened out along with the contamination and will not be recycled. So there's no point in putting anything smaller than a tennis ball in your recycling. It won't be recycled, even if it is technically a material that's accepted for recycling, because they've got to get the contamination out of there. And unfortunately, it takes stuff that hypothetically could have been recycled. Um, then they separate the flats from the more three-dimensional shapes under the assumption the flat should all be paper products. That's why you should always be folding your boxes flat. Do not leave them intact, fold them flat. But on the flip side, never flatten plastics. There's a little bit of debate about whether or not it's okay to flatten cans. My understanding is you can flatten cans. They used to not want you to flatten cans, um, but never flatten your plastics because the different plastics, as designated by the numbers in the triangles, have to be separated. That's done by an optical sorting machine. If things have been smashed, it may not work. It may not actually get separated if you flatten your plastics. So they use an, uh, a magnet to pull out the ferrous materials like the steel cans. They use an eddy current to pull out the aluminum cans and aluminum foil, as long as it's in a ball bigger than a tennis ball. Otherwise it was screened out at the beginning of the process. Uh, aluminum pans, you know, the disposable pie pans and that kind of thing, those can go in your recycling too. The plastics get separated. They detect different properties in the different kinds of plastic, use jets of air to push them into different chutes. And then what comes out the end, unfortunately, a fair amount of what comes out the end ends up going to the landfill because again, stuff got in there that wasn't actually recyclable. Um, so there has been one real positive development within the last several years as far as helping us to recycle, getting information about how to recycle, where it's most beneficial, right on the packaging of the product that you buy. These are called how to recycle labels. Unfortunately, it's a voluntary system. Companies have to choose to join the system. They have to pay to be part of the system. Not every company does, unsurprisingly, but they are showing up on more and more products. Sadly, there's no, or at least not a very large minimum size requirement for them. So they sometimes can be very small. But if you aren't already noticing how to recycle labels on products you buy, look for them. There's actually multiple labels. There's the widely recyclable label, which means basically any place in the United States that recycles at all should accept it. There's the Sometimes recyclable, so it depends on where you live. You have to check your local provider's guidelines. There's not yet recyclable with the line through it. I've had people tell me, but it says it's recyclable. They just don't want to see the line. They <laughs> want it to be recycled. It has a recycling symbol. It's fine for and then store drop up. That's for plastic film, like the plastic shopping bags, the dry cleaner bags, that kind of I mean, thing. Do, but when it goes to the store, do they do anything other than put it in the landfill? Any Want to hear the truth from me? Some of that gets recycled. Do I believe it all gets recycled? No, I do not. So it's just really it probably depends on the company. I, I don't. I don't want to take a lot of questions right now. There will be some time for questions afterwards. But I'll be honest. I don't think there's. Well, I don't think there's enough of a market even for all the plastic film that people are taking to stores much less the vastly larger volume of plastic film that people generate as waste that never gets taken to a store. But some of it does get recycled. So sometimes a product will have multiple things because it's a multiple, it has multiple, like this was probably for some frozen entree or something. So I had a paper box with a plastic bowl that held the food that had plastic film on it. So it gives you directions for each component, et cetera. Because the first one yeah. that says plastic ball, I mean, there would be numbers in there, right? Yeah, but don't place too much emphasis on numbers. Okay, but... Don't place too much emphasis on numbers. Because uh, So for years in Kansas City, the rule was plastic containers, numbers one to seven are accepted. You may have recently seen an article in the Kansas City Star back in April, which blew open the truth, which is... Not all of those are actually being recycled. Now, I'm not saying anybody was lying to you. 
Those guidelines were put out with good intentions, but ultimately they proved to be, I talked about personal wish cycling earlier. Ultimately, they proved to be kind of a large scale wish cycling because again, a lot of those low value plastics we were sending overseas with the intention, with the wish that they'd actually be recycled, but it wasn't verified that they would be. We didn't know that they would be. We didn't have any proof that they would be. And ultimately we discovered a lot of it was not. Um, it's unfortunate, it's just the reality. So it will give you instructions like some containers have a label, plastic containers have a label that covers so much of the underlying container, a plastic label that covers so much of the underlying container that they prevent that optical sorter I talked about from detecting what kind of plastic the container is made out of and separating it so they won't get separated. So sometimes you have to take a label off in order to recycle things. Um, it gets, but at least it's on the label, right where you most need it. Now, let's talk about the problems with plastics, the bane of my existence. These triangles, which are literally uh, molded into virtually everything made out of plastic these days. And I do mean virtually everything, as I tell the volunteers, first time volunteers who come out to the recycling center, even the porta potty, as number two HDPE triangles, just like the one you'd see on the bottom of a water jug or a milk jug, molded into the walls and the door. That should be a clue to you that just because you see that triangle on something, particularly something plastic, because that's where you mostly see it, but on anything. Don't trust the triangle. That's not, people say, but it has a recycling symbol on it. I know it looks like that folks, but that's not really what those are. It's understandable why you would say, oh, that means you can recycle it. But it isn't what it means. If you ask the plastics industry, they'll tell you, oh no, that's not what we meant by that when we <clears throat> developed this labeling system in 1988. What those technically are is what are called rosin identification codes. They identify which plastic rosin the item was made from, but there are literally thousands of plastic rosins. But whether that plastic in that form, again, milk jug, porta potty at the recycling center made out of the same number two high density polyethylene plastic, one definitely accepted for recycling, the other one, no way. <laughs> Whether that plastic in that form is accepted for recycling depends on the rules of your recycling provider and their rules depend on what they have a market for. Because again, they just process the stuff. If there aren't other companies willing to buy and actually recycle the material, there's no point in collecting it because it's just gonna pile up in a warehouse. So these things are the bane of my existence. Now, back in 2013, it was announced by, what does ASTM stand for? I'm blanking on that now. They're now in charge of the rosin identification codes, originally the plastics industry created. They said, we're gonna change it because, oh my gosh, we've realized people are confused by these codes with the chasing arrows triangles. That's my cynical side. That confusion was deliberate. Plastics industry wanted us to think everything plastic was recyclable so we wouldn't worry about how much plastic waste we were producing. They would never admit to that, but there's been some stories that make it pretty clear that's really what was happening. So they said, well, we'll change it. We'll use plain triangles. Remember, this was June of 2013, they said this. I almost never still see those plain triangles. If the plastics industry was really interested in not confusing the public about what was recyclable and what was not, they would have changed by now. So we hardly ever see the plain triangles there. Fortunately, the EPA just announced that those should no longer be allowed to be put onto plastics, um, the plastics that are not widely recycled. Personally, I don't think those arrows triangles should be allowed on any plastics, period, because people misunderstand what they mean. Now the EPA can't make that change. The Federal Trade Commission has something called a green guide, which regulates, governs what claims about recyclability you can make. So they're in the process of revising that. Hopefully those arrows triangles on plastics 
and where they're in misleading, misleading on other products will soon be gone. Um, not quite finished with the problems with plastics. So here's the thing about plastics. Every time you recycle them, they degrade. So they can only be recycled a limited number of times. Unlike metals and glass, which can be recycled perpetually, no degradation over time. Paper products also do degrade each time you recycle them, but they don't come with all of the pollution downsides that plastics do. So when you recycle plastics, there's also loss in the process. So you don't get the same amount of plastic out of the end of the recycling process to use to make something that went into the process. A study by Beyond Plastics estimated that with PET plastic bottles, like a water bottle or a soda bottle, there's a 30% loss. So you lose 30% just because of the way the mechanical recycling process works. But wait, it gets worse. Okay. I must have accidentally skipped over this one. So this is a very recent article. A study out of the UK analyzed the wastewater coming out of a recycling plant there in the UK. And they found that the amount of microplastics being generated by the recycling process was mind boggling. Now, this is just the first study on this. We'll see what other studies show, but it was mind blowing when I read this. And even after they installed filters to try to catch the microplastics, a mind boggling amount was still coming out in the wastewater. So even if you're recycling your plastics, there's a problem with the process that I don't know how we figure that out. Unfortunately, plastic is also hiding everywhere. People think of this as a paper cup or add another one. Anyway, people think of this as a paper cup. They think of this as paper. These are coated with plastic. They're not recyclable because they're coated with plastic. Coffee cups. Trays like this are coated with plastic. All these different canisters coated with plastic. None of them recyclable. That's true. People in the back and people on Zoom. Chips, cornmeal, oats, breadcrumbs, mixed nuts, peanuts. Ice cream tubs, mm -hmm. salt, even salt, frozen juices. That's the very outside. Dried fruits. That's very outside, but you peel off that. Sometimes they're inside and outside. Sometimes they're just inside. It depends on like this is inside and outside coated. Um, and this it's not just plastic. There's some kind of metallized layer there as well. Um, oftentimes canisters combine metal with a paper cylinder. So they're called a canister because they're shaped like a can, but they're not all metal. This is a paper cylinder that's lined with plastic. And in the case of nuts, it looks like some kind of metalized. I'm not sure what exactly it is. Metal base, metal rim, plastic lid. The seal's gone now, but that was plastic as well. Composite materials like that are just a nightmare. It's just not feasible to recycle them. You got too many different things mixed together. Um, the last thing I want to say about that is sending something to the landfill is not always the least bad option. I understand. I don't want to send anything to landfill either, but it's not always the least bad option. We get a lot of people wanting to recycle this kind of stuff. Boom. Well, this stuff's a nightmare. We used to tank it at the centers that uh, we manage. Um, so people look at this and they think that's a big piece of plastic. It's really not. By volume, this is 95 to 98% air. Tiny little beads of polystyrene plastic. I don't know exactly how the process works, but I've seen the beads, they're tiny. You somehow expand them in a way that leaves a lot of air pockets. Why? Because it cushions. That's why it's used in packaging and it insulates, which is why it's used in coolers or cups or take out containers. It insulates. 
So by the time you squeeze the air out of it, think about what the two to 5% of this volume would be. That's all the actual plastic. So collected for recycling, you gotta have a huge container to store it in, but by the time you squeeze the air out of it in a process called densification, you hardly have any plastic to recycle. Wait, it's worse. The companies that make foam only want to recycle it if it's perfectly, absolutely clean. Because guess what? The industry standard is white, bright, white. How do you maintain cleanliness, particularly if you were trying to collect it with mixed with other materials? In a material that's porous, it has a porous surface. It's just, it's, it's, so if you want to recycle foam, you can drive it to a foam factory over in Kansas City, Kansas. This kind of foam, not food, not this kind of foam. They wouldn't take that, but block foam like this. You could, but is it worth it to burn the gas to go over there or even in your electric car to recycle what amounts to a very little bit of plastic? It's just not recyclable in any feasible fashion, in my opinion. Now, if you really wanna focus on recycling, don't worry as much as you probably are about your packaging waste. Because again, most of the impacts of whatever you bought in that packaging and the packaging occurred upstream, not when you, if you put it in the landfill. Worry less about your packaging waste and go to next level recycling. Focus on recycling the things that are more important. Rechargeable batteries, those have very valuable and toxic heavy metals in them. They should always be recycled. Single-use batteries are a lot more marginal for recycling, which is why it's hard to find some place to take them other than a household hazardous waste center. Electronics, make sure you're recycling all your electronics and your appliances. And I mean, there's a place near the 18th and Vine Historic District called Midwest Recycling Center that takes virtually everything that runs off a battery or a cord, so not just electronics, but almost anything electrical. I mean, they'll take an old hairdryer. They'll take an old vacuum cleaner. They'll take an old electric lawn equipment, a weed whacker or something like that. Metals, again, remember I said metals can be recycled perpetually with no degradation. We shouldn't be sending any metal to the landfill. Save up your metal. Periodically take it to a drop-off recycling center. We have scrap metal bins at two of the recycling centers we operate for bridging the gap. Overland Park has a scrap metal bin at its drop-off recycling center. They operate as a city. And there's obviously scrap metal companies around the area too. Make sure you're recycling your fluorescents, your compact fluorescent light bulbs, fluorescent tubes, fluorescent rings. Don't ever put those in the trash. It's tiny, it's a small amount, but they contain mercury vapor. If you don't already know, it's a neurotoxin. You don't want those breaking and releasing that mercury into the air where somebody's gonna breathe it in. And then there's your other waste that's not tech. Well, I went the wrong way. Other waste that's not technically recycling, but needs to be disposed of properly. Food waste, if you aren't yet composting. The amount of food waste in this country is just mind boggling to me. Um, it's estimated that somewhere in the range of 30 to 40% of all the food produced in this country goes to waste at some point along in the process. Now, obviously not all that happens in homes. A lot happens before it ever gets to a store and then stores waste a ridiculous amount and restaurants waste a ridiculous amount of food. Um, but it's important. And it's important for a couple of reasons. Hopefully, even I, even we, me and my wife, do unfortunately let food spoil on occasion before we eat it. We try not to, but we do occasionally. <laughs> But hopefully mostly what you have to compost is the scraps, the vegetable peels, the apple cores, that kind of thing. But all that stuff needs to be composted for a couple of reasons. One, if it goes into a landfill and anaerobically decomposes, it produces methane, which is a much more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide, 86 times roughly as potent over a 20 year time frame. So we don't need to be putting that stuff in a landfill for that reason. And two, it contains valuable nutrients that should be going back into farmland to keep feeding the soil. So if you aren't composting yet, you may not be able to compost at home. There are composting services now, several companies in the area. Uh, some will pick up from your house, some you have to take to a drop-off point. I'm not here to endorse any particular company. Make sure you're properly disposing of your household hazardous waste. 
your old insecticides and herbicides, your corrosive cleaning products, drain opening products, paints, um, almost anything that says danger, poison, corrosive on the label should go to a household hazardous waste facility, not be poured down a drain and not sent to the landfill. One exception on that, bleach bottles for, I don't know, they tip, often will say danger corrosive on. You don't have to take your bleach to it. You probably used it all up anyway, but make sure that this other waste is getting properly handled. Um, I am probably, let's see, we started a little late, but I'm still almost an hour in. So I should probably, I'm just gonna give you one quiz, see if you've been paying attention tonight. So, you don't always have a choice about how things you buy or package, but in some cases you do. If you are faced with this choice, which is better? Yeah. Oh, you have been paying attention. Yes, you're absolutely right because the aluminum can be recycled perpetually. It's very energy intensive to make first use aluminum, but it is eminently recyclable. Yeah, there is a plastic lining in it that burns off when they, melt, when they melt the can. It has to have a plastic lining because aluminum is reactive and you would not like the way your Coke tastes taste if they didn't. All drink cans are lined with plastic. All food cans, virtually all food cans are lined with plastic. Um, <clears throat> one added benefit of choosing the can is typically... The cans are smaller serving sizes, and who among us probably wouldn't benefit from less sugar <laughs> or artificial sweetener or whatever. So good, you guys passed the quiz, everyone who spoke up anyway. So I'll stop there. We have a little time for questions. I'll be happy to take any questions you have, brick bats you want to throw, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Doug was trying to answer a question during the, ask a question during the talk. So I'll go to Doug first. Who do you have these? Generic yeah. Is there a color code for these? They don't color code them. They're black and white. Yeah. That's an interesting idea. I don't know if the organization that created those, which is how to recycle under the Sustainable Packaging Coalition, I think is I think is the overarching organization. I don't know if they've ever considered doing some kind of color uh color coding on those it would, Jer it would require another chemical that's true it would require more color and then that's a chemical yes jerry you talked about uh not recycling things that are too small how small can a piece of paper be so that's yeah recycling? yeah so that's a little different because papers obviously moves differently as it goes to the materials recovery facility but still Little bits of paper can't be processed. This I is why you should little paper in the larger envelopes in the larger envelopes. So, so <laughs> sort of. <laughs> First of all, don't ever put shredded paper in a recycle. But the reality is that any paper in pieces smaller than a playing card, roughly that big, as the fibers in it are too short to make good quality recycled paper. The quality of the recycled paper is determined by cleanliness and by the length of the fiber in the papers, which is why paper can only be recycled a limited number of times. Each time it's recycled, the fibers get shorter. So I wouldn't put pieces smaller than that. They would go through the system, but then it's still not going to make good quality well, recycled paper. Envelope. Well, they'll go through the system, but again, There's their no fibers place. are still short. So There's no getting around that. Much of fibers that can kind of be so. So it all gets blind. pulped. Paper gets pulped for recycling, so they get it really wet, turn it into pulpy mass, and roll it out. But the reality is, those fibers going in are short, so they don't make good quality recycled paper. I don't put any paper in that's smaller than that size. Um, don't put cash register receipts in your recycling. <laughs> don't put cash register receipts in your recycling. Um, Everybody in this room looks like they, well, almost everybody in this room looks like they're old enough to remember when cash register receipts were ordinary paper printed on with ink. That's almost never the case these days. For decades, cash register receipts have been what are called, been made with what is called thermal paper, which has chemicals in it. When you apply heat in a pattern, the printing appears. Those chemicals are undesirable anywhere, including in recycling. 
The most notorious one is bisphenol A, which is a hormone disrupting chemicals. You should always wash your hands after handling a receipt and I feel for cashiers. This is modern innovation, putting hormone disrupting chemicals into paper. Don't recycle cash register receipts. I'm not sure. I think you were next, Jane, this right? Kind of, yeah, Jane, a little policy question. Yeah. Uh, you said you could fix the system with some laws, yeah. like repairability, return receipt, uh, return and deposit, and I'll put the burden on the producer. Mm -hmm. So which, if we don't have mandates, are mandates better or should we incentivize with tax credits and all kinds of things, particularly those hard to recycle things like batteries and all that, and computers? Should should we try to get the political policy focused on incentivizing, like help people with their recycling, or mandate? Well, so policies. obviously that's tricky. <laughs> Typically, <laughs> tend to. Typically, people tend to be more likely to embrace the incentives, particularly the corporations who would otherwise be mandated to do things. But there are some things that you just have to mandate, in my opinion, for the greater collective good. Um, and there's only so much that we as taxpayers can do to incentivize things, too, particularly in the current political environment. I don't see how we could pass anything of that sort either way, mandates or incentives right now with regard to recycling, extended producer responsibility, any of that. Uh, yes. How about recycling in use refrigerator, refrigerating? Yeah, there you can do that. Um, where, where can you do that? Pretty sure Midwest Recycling Center is still taking. Now, for free on containing items, they do charge a fee. Most things they take for no charge. But, but for free on containing items, they do charge a fee for things like CRT monitors and old tube TVs. There's a fee. And do they handle the refrigerator? Oh, I'm sure they. There's lots of regulations on, okay. on handling uh, refrigerants. So. They would be they would be risking a lot of legal trouble if they didn't handle the refrigerants properly. It's called Midwest Recycling Center. They might not be the only option in the area, but that's the primary one I think of. John, down in North Kansas City, there's uh, I don't know if it's Casey Iron Works. They'll take compressors out of air conditioners. Used to you had to drain the oil, but now they accept them with oil in them. Interesting. I had not heard that. Okay. Kansas City Iron Works, you think, is the name? Yeah, I, I can look here on myself. Okay. I, I've taken stuff. Yes, Jim. So, as I understand it, that Big Fire and KCK, yep. from the area down here in Dutchie County, KCK, that was at a recycling center. It was at an automobile recycling center. So, it wasn't when I first somebody texted me that there was a fire at a recycling plant, a friend, and it was in KCK, I was afraid that it was at the materials recovery facility I talked about earlier, which is shown in the video that's linked to on the sheet there. Because fires regularly happen at materials recovery facilities, typically because people put lithium batteries into the recycling. Never put batteries in the mix recycling. Batteries, lithium batteries, rechargeable batteries, even primary lithium batteries should, which are the single use lithium batteries, should be recycled. They can't be recycled mixed with other materials and they are flammable. They catch fire in trash trucks, recycling trucks. They catch fire in materials recovery facilities. Uh, never put those kinds of batteries. But where that happened, and I don't think we, in fact, I think I read today that we may never know what actually caused the fire at that mm -hmm. automobile recycling yard. I think um, I think it's an Advantage Metals yard, um, scrap yard. Yeah, the only thing I think got from the story I read is they were smashing down on cars. Yeah. Who knows was what cars contain a lot of a lot of stuff. I hate to think about what pollutants were emitted by that fire. Yes. Um, so we all know that you can't recycle your film or you know plastic bags and films. No oh, bag oh believe me, not everybody knows that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't bag your recycling either. <laughs> yeah, my neighbors don't because I walk by and I see them. You know, and what always confuses me is why, if that's the case. 
and it was in the article with the star they talked about you know those are the devil of our of our yeah. facility because it's we have to stop and it costs money and <laughs> why don't they communicate that to us why is it it was they rely on the kansas city star and the people so so I don't know who your recycling provider is, and we live in Kansas City. My wife and I live in Kansas City. If you go to the city's website, there is information on there, and the new recycling lidded wheeled recycling carts that are finally rolling out in Kansas City, Missouri, have a sticker on the top that at least has the basics of the guidelines. I'm sure it doesn't have a great deal of detail just because of limited space and limited expectation of how much time people are willing to spend looking at it. Um, but, so in Kansas gets more complicated because except in KCK, it's mostly private haulers. I think Olathe, city of Olathe also does their own, is in charge of their own recycling. So you have to go to your private hauler. Um, you know, Here's the challenge. While you could hypothetically send out a mailer to every one of your customers, how many of them would actually get read for the expense? So they have it on their websites. Well, some bins do have them. They don't all, you're absolutely right. They don't all have them. Believe me, I agree with you. I think they should be much more proactive than they have been. And this Metro-wide curbside recycling flyer that is in the process of being revised by the Mid-America Regional Council will be that kind of tool when it's ready. But it's not ready yet. I would have loved to have been able to bring you copies of it tonight, but it's not ready yet. How does it get distributed? How does it get? Well, it's through. It so it's so it's on the RecycleSpot.org website when it's ready. <laughs> so recycles. I hear you. I hear you. So, so Mid America Regional Council simply simply could not afford to mail it to every household in the metro area. There's simply no money for that. I mean, you know, I used to give the old one, and I'll give the new one away at the recycling centers once I have it. But obviously, that doesn't reach more than a fraction of the population. Um, so. I'll tell you one thing we need in Kansas City, well, beyond Kansas City, we need more recycling ambassadors, I'll call them. The people who are willing to take the time to find the information to then spread it to their friends and family who haven't been willing or, frankly, are really just too busy to go searching for this information. And the neighbors aren't interested. Some people are not going to be interested, that's for sure. Uh, Dan, you, Jerry, you asked one, so I'm going to go to Dan next because I know we got to be running out of time. I've got yeah. two online questions. Oh, okay. This is quick. Yeah. I asked her paper bags at the grocery store that have handles. Mm -hmm. Are those handles a problem? Paper paper bags are dependent. A lot of paper bags, the handles are made out of the same kind of paper the bag is made out of. You don't need to worry about it. But more upscale stores, their bags that aren't just like regular mm -hmm. grocery bags. They can be plastic laminated. If they have a fancy matte finish, you can be sure that's got plastic on it. Just throw it in your trash. They'll put all kinds of fabric handles on them. Any fabric handle that's on a, a paper bag should come off. If it's not plastic recycling, the whole thing should go into the trash. Sometimes plastic handles are on bag, paper bags. I mean, your average grocery sack, the handles are made out of the same material as the bag, you don't need to worry about taking those off. Uh, what's, since Jerry already asked one question, what's the online questions? Okay. <clears throat> so you mentioned recycling rechargeable batteries. Mm -hmm. I think it's worth noting that you should not put those in with your household recycling. I guess this is not a question. Yeah, right, so and, I, and I probably, I mean, I did just talk about that. So I probably talked about it after they posted it. Here, here is a question. What about mm -hmm. medicine bottles and bottle caps? So prescription drug bottles have never been accepted for recycling. You should never put those in your recycling. Uh, those are typically the amber color, although I've seen Walmart at least sometimes have used blue ones because they're Walmart and blue is their color. I've seen green ones. The important point is not the color. Those, there's basically three marks against those. They're small, particularly the diameter around is much smaller than a tennis ball. They're unlikely to make it through the screening for contamination early in the process to the number five polypropylene they're made out of 
is really rigid, not a desirable kind of plastic for recycling, period. And three, drug residue potential. You don't really want various drugs mixed together in your plastic recycling. Now, here's some bad news for you. It is possible that over-the-counter drug bottles and supplement bottles may not be accepted anymore once these revisions go into effect. That's not definite as of now, but those may not be accepted. And some of them already are too small uh, to make it through the decontamination process. Little, tiny little ibuprofen bottles or whatever, those are never gonna get recycled. They're just too small. Um, we had one more, no, we didn't, okay. Um, sorry, Jerry, I keep going to other people because you got to ask one. I'm not, we'll go here. Those god awful shrink wrap things on the on bottles that you have to. <laughs> the, have the to labels, the shrink sleeve. Can those stay on? No. So there are a few companies that have adopted a compatible label that doesn't need to come off. But the only way you can know if the what you buy is from one of those companies is if it, one, is a company that has adopted the how to recycle labeling system, and two, it does not tell you take the label off. Um, I don't remember whether this photo showed it that way or not. So, so this one, you would have to take off. That one, with that symbol, you would not have to take off because it doesn't tell you to take the label off. Now, it used to be that a lot of these, these in the industry, there's a little lingo for you. This is called a full body shrink sleeve. And it's really annoying because they have multiplied, proliferated maddeningly on products. Why? I can only guess, I'm not involved in the meetings, but companies must love them because it gives them more space for graphics and marketing. But this is an example of what happens when you let companies decide whatever they want to do to make their products sell, rather than making them design for recyclability and minimizing waste. Now, how to recycle used to let any container that had one of these labels bear a label that said, remove the label. But They've decided that's too much to ask of consumers. So unless a company now either uses a compatible label that doesn't have to come off or they perforate the label so you can easily tear it off, it has to bear a not recyclable label because they don't think it's fair to ask people, ordinary citizens, to get out a knife or scissors or whatever and start hacking away on a label trying to get that thing off of it. So they're not allowed to say it's recyclable anymore. And I think that's good because that should force them to either one, don't use that label. Like I've seen some yogurt brands that used to use that kind of label that had to come off and they went to printing directly onto the plastic. So there's no label that needs to come off. Or they can switch to a compatible label that doesn't have to come off. Yes. John, are there communities you know of that are uh, serving in bulk, if you bring your own containers, I'm talking glass and metal. Communities? Communities, like I'm thinking Oregon, they're just full of oh. places. Yeah, I mean, there's a few <laughs> refill stores um, for where you can get body care products and cleaning products. Again, I'm not gonna endorse any particular company, but I think there's one called the Refillery and there's Soap Refill Station in Waldo. Um, if you search for refill store, Kansas City, I would imagine it will come up. Um, there's not a lot of options, that's for sure. And certainly not, you're not going to get the same variety that you get in the big box store. So there is a trade off in the time for the time. Sheets for dishwasher liquid, instead of liquid, sheets for washing machines. You can, there's some question about one of the ingredients that's commonly used in those kind of sheets, whether it's truly safe to have it degrading into water. It's called PVA or polyvinyl alcohol. The EPA approves it, but there, there are outside groups who think that should not be considered a safe choice. So I, I hate to break it to you people, 
But again, because we like companies do what they want to do, because, hey, it's America. We're free. It's complicated. It's complicated. Um, sorry, Jerry. There's always new people that haven't asked yet. Yes. The milk or? Yeah. You mentioned that they are recycled. They are accepted for recycling, yes. What happens to them? Well, so, again, that's a composite material, so I didn't bring into those, did I? So, Think of the kind of paper, you think of it as paper, paper milk carton that's refrigerated. It has the gable top, the pinch closure at the top. So people think of those as paper. Of course, if they were actually just paper, your milk would never make it to the store or home with you. They would just soak through. They're coated with plastic inside and out. Normally, that would not be accepted for recycling because of the plastic on it. But, and I talk about this on the sheet, the companies that make the cartons, not the products in the cartons, but the cartons didn't want people to say, I'm not going to buy that. I won't be able to recycle it. So they have subsidized setting up recycling for their cartons, but only their cartons. Now, in some cases, they do go to the trouble of separating the paper and the plastic. I'm sure the plastic just goes to the landfill. It's going to be too low value and the paper gets turned into something low grade. The one thing I've heard of that they just use the whole carton. And it's not just the gable top cartons. There's also the aseptic cartons, which are box shaped and dairy-free beverages and soups and broths and stocks and things are sold in. Those are also accepted for recycling. The one thing I've heard of that those, some of those are made into uh, intact without the separation is a kind of wall board. Um, how much... Is there nearly enough demand for that kind of wall board for all the cartons that Americans put out as waste? I can't imagine. So other things have, would have to be figured out to do with those cartons. I'll be honest. That's another thing where, yeah, they're accepted. But am I highly confident all that are accepted are being recycled? I am not highly confident of that just because of the nature of the material is problematic to deal with because you got paper and plastic. And in the case of the aseptic cartons, two layers of plastic, paper, and aluminum. That's why you don't have to refri they don't have to be refrigerated until you open them. It's just problematic when materials are bonded together like that to recycle. Yes, Chad. Let's do one more question and then we'll all right, Jerry. <laughs> oh quick one. Yeah. Did you say earlier that if you took a sack of newspapers and put them in a paper sack they wouldn't get recycled because you put too much inside of them? Did no, that's that? not how paper recycling works. Putting stuff inside of an open paper sack is not a big deal. It's better, better to put everything in loose. Never put anything in a plastic sack. Yeah, okay. if, a pl if a plastic bag with stuff in it shows up in the materials recovery facility, they're going to send that right to the landfill, folks. They do not have time to open that up and try and deal with whatever might be hiding inside. And believe me, you can't imagine what might be hiding inside. Don't think too much about it. They're not going to do that. The line, it's a blunt instrument. That line you'll see in the video. If you go to YouTube and watch the video, I put the link to on the page. That line moves fast. It has to for recycling to be economically viable. Unless we make companies pay for the recycling process, which some states, New York, I believe, and California, and maybe some others are moving towards requiring companies to pay municipalities. And there's been federal legislation posed along those lines, but yeah, <laughs> we can't even lift the desk ceiling without, don't get me on that soapbox. So I know there probably are more questions now and more questions will come up. After you leave on the drive home, while you're taking a shower, whatever, my email address is on the sheet as well. I may regret this, yeah. but you can send me your questions. Well, once again, thank you all for coming out. Uh, this was our first uh, time to do hybrid where we're in person and by Zoom, and I, I think it worked okay. Um, I, I may try to find some other folks to recruit to help you know, run the chat board and all that as we get more into it. Uh, but uh, We've got a few more minutes for you to, to mingle a little bit, but thanks for coming out and we'll see you next month. Thanks. Thanks, John.